Chapter 11 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 7, by John Hay and John George Nicolay, Chapter 11, Port Hudson. The great work of freeing the Mississippi was not complete when the flags of truce fluttered from the works of Vicksburg, 200 miles below the confederate flag still waved defiantly from the stronghold of port hudson a brief review of the state of things in the department of the gulf is necessary to explain the circumstances under which this last river fortress fell general banks had dispatched to the department of the gulf in the autumn of 1862. He carried with him from New York a strong force of troops, not much less than 20,000 men, and instructions to advance up the Mississippi with the forces he took and those he should find in Louisiana to act in cooperation with General Grant to clear the river, after which he was to establish a line of land communications from New Orleans to Vicksburg, and then to plant himself in the Red River country in such a manner as to protect Louisiana and Arkansas, and form a basis for future operations against Texas, a subject which, in view of our relations with Mexico, greatly occupied at that time the mind of the president before he sailed he made so large a requisition for supplies of all sorts as to strike the president with dismay he sent it back to the general with this sermon of kindly severity early last week you left me in high hope with your assurance that you would be off with your expedition at the end of that week or early in this it is now the end of this and i have just been overwhelmed and confounded with the sight of a requisition made by you which i am assured cannot be filled and got off within an hour short of two months I enclose you a copy of the requisition, in some hope that it is not genuine and that you have never seen it. My dear General, this expanding and piling up of impedimenta has been so far almost our ruin, and will be our final ruin if it is not abandoned." if you had the articles of this requisition upon the wharf with the necessary animals to make them of any use the forage for the animals you could not get vessels together in two weeks to carry the whole to say nothing of your twenty thousand men and having the vessels you could not put the cargoes aboard in two weeks more and after all where you are going you have no use for them when you parted with me you had no such ideas in your mind i know you had not or you could not have expected to be off so soon as you said you must get back to something like the plan you had then or your expedition is a failure before you start you must be off before congress meets you would be better off anywhere and especially where you are going 
for not having a thousand wagons doing nothing but hauling forage to feed the animals that draw them and taking at least two thousand men to care for the wagons and animals who otherwise might be two thousand good soldiers now dear general do not think this is an ill-natured to banks letter it is the very reverse the simple publication of this requisition would ruin you general banks wasted no time after his arrival at new orleans which was about the middle of december before disembarking his troops he sent ten thousand of them under general Covier grover to take possession of baton rouge as grover did not consider himself strong enough at that moment to take port hudson which was twenty-five miles further up the river the next movement banks made was not so judicious harassed by the entreaties of general andrew j hamilton the military governor of texas and a rather disreputable lot of local politicians whom hamilton kept about him he sent a small detachment to take possession of galveston on the texas coast which as soon as it landed was captured by an overwhelming force of confederates under j b magruder the gunboat Harriet Lane being taken at the same time, and her gallant commander, J. M. Wainwright, killed. This happened on January 1st, an inauspicious opening for the new year. Later in the same month, General Banks set on foot an expedition to move up the Bayou Tetch, and in connection with another force which was to leave the mississippi river at plaquemines to take the post at butte a la rose but the bayou plaquemines was found to be absolutely impassable and the expedition was finally abandoned at the request of admiral farragut who was proposing to run past the port hudson batteries for the purpose of patrolling the river between that point and vicksburg and who asked general banks to make a demonstration by land to assist him this he did moving in the rear of port hudson on the fourteenth and occupying the attention of the enemy by slight skirmishing while farragut with the hartford and albatross successfully passed the batteries on the river the rest of his fleet however having failed to follow him banks not having the force to make a serious attack on the confederate works brought his men back to baton rouge and himself returned to new orleans he was criticized in the report of the general-in-chief for not having invested port hudson at that time but general halleck was manifestly in error in his censure as the rebel forces at port hudson were then at their maximum the official returns for that month showed a total of twenty thousand men with sixteen thousand ready for duty the confederate forces in louisiana were at that time commanded by general richard taylor they had a post called fort bisland at berwick at the western terminus of the railroad connecting new orleans and brashear city they had full command of the country from that point to alexandria where a strong force called Fort de Russy commanded the Red River. It was to break up the rebel force upon this line that Banks had projected the movement in the winter, and he now made preparations as promptly as possible 
considering the difficulties under which he labored from deficiency of transportation to resume that interrupted enterprise he started on the eleventh of april with about seventeen thousand men and after a, a sharp skirmish his troops captured fort brisland the confederates retreating northward to opelousas banks followed in keen pursuit and took opelousas on the twentieth of april butte a la rose was captured at the same time by the gunboats and banks moving northward arrived on the ninth of may at alexandria driving the confederates northward to shreveport farragut's vessels strongly reinforced by porter joined the troops at alexandria and a very large extent of eastern louisiana was thus practically restored to the possession of the union banks had acted with promptness and vigor and banks with a loss of only about six hundred men he had captured two thousand prisoners and twenty-two guns and had taken or destroyed great quantities of property of value to the enemy this enterprise however successful and judicious as it is now seen to be did not meet the approval of the general-in-chief whose mind was fixed upon the purpose of a junction between grant and banks to act successively against port hudson and vicksburg general banks and general grant during the months of march and april were continually in correspondence with the purpose of effecting this object but with the utmost good will on both sides it was found to be impracticable in the first place the difficulties of communication between the two generals were enormous their letters were weeks in reaching each other and every movement proposed in one became obsolete long before the answer was received from this cause a serious misunderstanding arose between halleck grant and banks for which neither of the three can be properly blamed grant made a conditional promise of reinforcement to banks in a letter of the twenty third of march but banks received it on the twenty first of april after the situation was materially changed banks wrote to grant on the tenth of april telling him when he could join him and with what force but this letter came to the hands of grant only after the victory of port gibson had opened to grant the way to jackson while grant was concentrating his forces at grand gulf he sent a dispatch to banks engaging him to send him an army corps to bayou serra by the twenty fifth to cooperate with him on port hudson and asking if after the reduction of port hudson banks could assist him at Fitzburg. a month passed before the dispatch reached banks and being repeated to him from new orleans without giving date he naturally understood the twenty fifth to mean the twenty fifth of may and so answered that he would be there probably by the twenty-fifth certainly by the first meaning the first of june but as we have seen before this answer reached the hands of grant he was far on his way toward the capital of mississippi all thought of waiting for banks assistant having long ago passed from his mind he responded instantly however explaining why he had not waited for banks and urged banks either to join him or send all the force he could spare to co cooperate in the great struggle this dispatch was promptly delivered 
reaching Banks at Alexandria on the 12th of May. He answered, regretting the impossibility of joining Grant for the perfectly valid reason they had neither water nor, trans nor land transportation to make the movement. He gave General Grant in this letter a full and accurate account of his situation and announced to him his intention of investing Port Hudson, which was unquestionably the wisest thing he could do. Banks put his troops at once in motion across the, the Anchifalafia on the 9th of May, marched down the bank of the Mississippi to the point opposite Bayou Serra, where they were slowly and toilsomely ferried across the river, and then moved swiftly to Port Hudson, arriving there on the 24th of May, and meeting C. C. Auger's division, which had been directed to join him from Baton Rouge. The junction was effected successfully after a slight skirmish with the enemy, whom Auger promptly repulsed. The works of Port Hudson were very strong, too strong, as it appeared in the end, to justify an assault from a force so little superior as was Banks to that of the enemy. But the same consideration which impelled Grant twice to assault the works of Vicksburg induced Banks to take the same action. He assaulted on the 25th, immediately after his arrival, and again on the 14th of June. The result of these two attacks was precisely the same as in the case of Grant. No benefit was derived from them except a slight advance in position, which, however, did not compensate for the terrible loss of life involved. The curious parallelism between the cases of the two commanders is continued also to the extent of their losses. About 4,000 men were lost in the assaults at Vicksburg, and nearly the same number at Port Hudson. Siege operations were then resumed, the investment rendered absolutely complete, and the garrison in Port Hudson held with a steadily tightening grasp until the end. Banks was not left to complete the capture of the place at his leisure. He had not only the care of the enemy inside the works upon his mind, but he was painfully drawn in two other directions at once. General Halleck was writing dispatch after dispatch, commanding him with the most cutting emphasis to go to the assistance of Grant. General W. H. Emory, whom he had left in charge at New Orleans, was sending the most importunate appeals to him to return to that city or all would be lost. Even while the Confederate troops were marching out of the works at Vicksburg, Emory wrote, I respectfully suggest that unless Port Hudson be already taken, you can only save this city by sending me reinforcements immediately and at any cost. It is a choice between Port Hudson and New Orleans. But, disregarding the importunities from both quarters, both imperfectly advised of the real state of affairs, Banks pursued the judicious course of standing by the work in hand. The danger to which General Emory referred was by no means imaginary. New Orleans was more severely menaced than at any other time during the war. General Taylor, after the unsuccessful attack upon Milliken's Bend had returned to Alexandria and organized a considerable force, 
variously estimated at from three thousand to five thousand men with this he had moved in two detachments upon berwick bay he sent colonel j p major with a force of cavalry by way of plaque amends to attack brashear city in the rear while with generals alfred mouton and thomas green he moved his main force down the tetch and the two forces came together on the twenty fourth exactly at the time ordered taylor captured the place taking several hundred invalid and convalescent prisoners and a large amount of valuable stores he then sent general green assisted by major's cavalry to donaldsonville midway between new orleans and port hudson while he pushed another party to within twenty-five miles of new orleans creating little less than a panic in the city which justified general amory's dispatch to banks on the twenty eighth green attacked donaldsonsville which was protected by a small earthwork and garrisoned by only two hundred and twenty five men of the twenty eighth maine regiment under major j d bullen the assaulting force was about ten times that of the defenders they attacked a little after midnight and met with a severe repulse at the hands of the gallant little harrison and the gunboats in the mississippi they withdrew several miles down the river and there erected batteries which if they could have been made permanent would have placed bank's army and the city of new orleans in a most critical position but the tremendous events which were taking place along the river rendered the well-laid plan of taylor of little avail when the great news of vicksburg arrived in the union camp around port hudson it was greeted with the thunder of artillery and the joyous shouts of northern soldiers the confederate pickets who had already established the same social relations modified by rifle practice which had been so long in force at vicksburg inquired of the cause of this rejoicing and general gardner became thus informed of the uselessness of further resistance he surrendered the place on the ninth of july weitzel and grover were at once sent down to donaldsonsville and after a sharp engagement in which neither side gained any special advantage the confederates withdrew to brashear city whither they were not very vigorously pursued banks retook the place on the twenty second of july and taylor moved northward along the line of the tetch where he passed the winter the fruits of banks victory were about six thousand prisoners actually paroled if we add to this the five hundred sick and wounded in the hospitals and nearly eight hundred lost during the siege it will be seen that the campaign of port hudson added six thousand three hundred and forty men to the grand aggregate taken from the confederacy in this summer's work they lost fifty-one pieces of artillery and over five thousand small arms it seemed as if the stars in their courses were fighting to make everything east and west gilt with new luster the anniversary of american independence one of the most brilliant of the minor victories of the war was gained at helena arkansas on the west bank of the mississippi on the fourth of july general holmes had asked and received permission to take that place in the middle of june and had mustered for the purpose an army 
of nearly ten thousand men the garrison at helena consisted of a division of the thirteenth corps and a brigade of cavalry numbering in all four thousand men commanded by major general b m prentiss holmes felt so sure of victory that he doubtless selected the fourth of july for his attack in a mere spirit of bravado he assaulted at daylight with converging columns two of which made considerable impression upon the outworks but never reached the town the defense of the union troops was singularly skillful and energetic and after a few hours of fighting holmes finding himself utterly defeated retired at half past ten the little army of prentiss was of course too small to pursue the last confederate attempt to hold the mississippi river thus ended in a complete and most humiliating repulse sherman who had been ordered by grant to hold himself in readiness to set out in search of johnston the moment vicksburg fell had obeyed the order with such efficiency that although the city surrendered two days before the proposed assault sherman was ready to start within an hour from the time when the confederates stacked their arms he took with them a splendid army consisting of the thirteenth fifteenth and ninth corps holding the center with his own with ord on the right and park on the left in this order they marched rapidly on the track of johnston over roads thick with dust and in weather of tropical heat there was very little water to be had along the route and johnston had taken pains to spoil even that scanty supply wherever possible by driving cattle hogs and sheep into the ponds and shooting them there but these were light afflictions to sherman's hardy veterans and they arrived on the morning of the ninth in robust health and high spirits before the field works in front of jackson here general johnston awaited them in the full hope and confidence that they would be compelled to attack him for want of water and safely established behind his earthworks he counted on them inflicting a severe repulse upon them but when two days had passed and instead of a dash upon his fortifications he found that sherman had quietly extended his flanks to the pearl river above and below the town and was preparing entrenchments for his formidable artillery johnston's heart failed him and he telegraphed to jefferson davis that it would be impossible for want of supplies to stand a siege and that therefore unless the enemy attacked him he must abandon the place hot skirmishing began on the twelfth with continually increasing fire of, of artillery general lauman with misdirected zeal went too far near the confederate works and was severely handled both in front and in rear we might say for at general ord's request he was relieved from his command a punishment rather too prompt and severe for a single error of judgment on the part of an officer of great courage and merit an attempt was next made by general johnston to cut off sherman's artillery train which his scouts had reported as approaching by the jackson road but this failing and johnston having heard that the train was near the federal camp he decided to evacuate the place and accomplished it with that singular skill and address which never failed him on such occasions 
he crossed the river upon bridges inside of his lines without exciting the least suspicion on the part of his accomplished adversary and sherman for the second time entered the capital of mississippi from which johnston had retired in perfect safety and was now miles away he was followed a little distance but sherman concluding that pursuit in that torrid weather would be fatal to his army he returned to vicksburg and went into camp the great work was done the army of the tennessee and its commanders received the enthusiastic plaudits of a grateful country grant was made a major general in the regular army sherman and mcpherson were promoted to being brigadiers in the regular service there was no cloud upon their satisfaction over a great duty well performed as general halleck said in his dispatch of congratulation they could feel that they had deserved the gratitude of your country and it will be the boast of your children that their fathers were of the heroic army which reopened the mississippi river up to this time no general in the field had shown less thought than grant of his personal future or of those prospects which are so frequently presented to the imagination of successful military leaders but it is recorded that he said many years afterward in one of those characteristic phrases of simple directness peculiar to him after the capture of vicksburg i regarded it as probable that it would fall to my lot to command the army and to end the war one of the minor crosses which successful soldiers are called upon to bear is the imputation that the plans of their triumphant campaigns were suggested by subordinates or dictated by superiors but in the case of general grant fortunate in this as in everything else the door was forever closed against such an imputation by the swift and generous testimony of his superiors and his most intimate subordinate sherman lost no time in saying that the plan of the vicksburg campaign was grant's and grant's alone general halleck gave him this unqualified and ungrudging praise in boldness of plan rapidity of execution and brilliancy of results these operations will compare most favorably with those of napoleon about ohm while from the president came the following letter which we believe no other ruler that ever lived would have had the magnanimity to write my dear general i do not remember that you and i ever met personally i write this now as a grateful acknowledgment for your almost inestimable service you have done the country i wish to say a word further when you first reached the vicinity of vicksburg i thought you should do what you finally did march the troops across the neck run the batteries with the transports and thus go below and i never had any faith except a general hope that you knew better than i that the yazoo pass expedition and the like could succeed when you got below and took port hudson grand gulf and vicinity i thought you should go down the river and join general banks and when you turned northward east of the big black i feared it was a mistake i now wish to make the personal acknowledgment that you were right and i was wrong there remained but one act to close the mighty drama of the struggle for the great river of the west which for two years had shaken its bluffs with the thunder 
and of artillery and had reddened its turbid waters with the blood of brothers this was accomplished on the sixteenth of july when the steamboat imperial quietly landed at the wharf in new orleans arriving direct from st louis laden with a commercial cargo having passed over the whole course of that great thoroughfare of commerce undisturbed by a hostile shot or challenge from bluff or levee on either shore End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of abraham lincoln a history volume seven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume seven by john hay and john george nicolay chapter twelve vallandigham general burnside took command of the department of the ohio march twenty five eighteen sixty three with a zeal against the insurgents only heightened by his defeat at fredericksburg he found his department infested with a peculiarly bitter opposition to the government and to the prosecution of the war amounting in his opinion to positive aid and comfort to the enemy and he determined to use all the powers confided to him to put an end to these manifestations which he considered treasonable and in the execution of this purpose he gave great latitude to the exercise of his authority he was of a zealous and impulsive character and weighed too little the consequences of his acts where his feelings were strongly enlisted he issued on the thirteenth of april an order which obtained wide celebrity under the name of general order number thirty eight announcing that all persons found within our lines who commit acts for the benefit of the enemies of our country will be tried as spies or traitors and if convicted will suffer death he enumerated as among the acts which came within the view of this order the writing and carrying of secret letters passing the lines for treasonable purposes recruiting for the confederate service harboring concealing or feeding public enemies within our lines and rising beyond this reasonable category of offences he declared that the habit of declaring sympathy for the enemy will not be allowed in this department persons committing such offences will be at once arrested with a view to being tried as above stated or sent beyond our lines into the lines of their friends and in conclusion he added a clause which may be made to embrace in its ample sweep any demonstration not to the taste of the general in command it must be distinctly understood that treason expressed or implied will not be tolerated in this department this order at once excited a most furious denunciation on the part of those who either on account of their acts or their secret sympathies felt themselves threatened by it and many even of those opponents of the administration who were entirely loyal to the union criticized the order as illegal in itself and liable to lead to dangerous abuses the most energetic and eloquent of general burnside's assailants was clement l vallandigham who had been for several years a member of congress from ohio whose intemperate denunciation of the government had caused him the loss of his seat and whose defeat had only heightened the acerbity of his opposition to the war general order number thirty eight furnished him a most inspiring text for assailing the government and he availed himself of it in democratic meetings throughout the state 
a rumor of his violent speeches came to the ears of the military authorities in cincinnati and an officer was sent in citizens clothes to attend a meeting which was held at mount vernon ohio where mr vallandigham and other prominent democrats were the orators of the day the meeting was an enthusiastic one full of zeal against the government and of sympathy with the south mr vallandigham feeling his audience thoroughly in harmony with him spoke with unusual fluency and bitterness greatly enjoying the applause of his hearers and unconscious of the presence of the unsympathizing recorder who leaned against the platform a few feet away and took down some of his most malignant periods he said it was the design of those in power to usurp a despotism that it was not their intention to effect a restoration of the union that the government had rejected every overture of peace from the south and every proposition of mediation from europe that the war was for the liberation of the blacks and the enslavement of the whites that general order number thirty eight was a base usurpation of arbitrary power that he despised it and spat upon it and trampled it under his feet speaking of the conscription act he said the people were not deserving to be free men who would submit to such encroachment on their liberties he called the president king lincoln and advised the people to come up together at the ballot-box and hurl the tyrant from his throne the audience and the speaker were evidently in entire agreement the crowd wore in great numbers the distinctive badges of copperheads and butternuts and amid cheers which vallandigham's speech elicited the witness heard a shout that jeff davis was a gentleman which was more than lincoln was the officer returned to cincinnati and made his report three days later on the evening of the fourth of may a special train went up to dayton with a company of the one hundred and fifteenth ohio to arrest mr vallandigham reaching dayton they went at once to his house where they arrived shortly before daylight and demanded admittance the orator appeared at an upper window and being informed of their business refused to allow them to enter he began shouting in a loud voice pistols were fired from the house the signals were taken up in the town and according to some preconcerted arrangement the fire-bells began to toll there was evidently no time to be lost the soldiers forced their way into the house vallandigham was compelled to dress himself in haste and was hurried to the cars and the special train pulled out of the station before any considerable crowd could assemble arriving at cincinnati vallandigham was consigned to the military prison and kept in close confinement during the day he contrived however to issue an address to the democracy of ohio saying i am here in a military bastille for no other offence than my political opinions and the defence of them and of the rights of the people and of your constitutional liberties i am a democrat for the constitution for law for the union for liberty this is my only crime meanwhile democrats of ohio of the northwest of the united states be firm be true to your principles to the constitution to the union and all will yet be well to you to the whole people to time i again appeal while he was issuing these fervid words his friends in dayton were making their demonstration in another fashion the town was filled with excitement all day crowds gathered on the streets discussing and denouncing the arrest great numbers of wagons loaded with rural friends and adherents of the agitator came in from the country and the excitement increasing as night came on a crowd of several hundred men moved hooting and yelling to the office of the republican newspaper some one threw a brick at the building then a volley of pistol shots was fired and the excitement of the crowd wreaked itself on the unoffending building which was first sacked and then destroyed by fire later in the night a company of troops arrived from cincinnati and before midnight the crowd was dispersed and order was restored 
mr vallandigham was promptly tried by a military commission convened may six by general burnside consisting of officers of his staff and of the ohio and kentucky volunteers mr vallandigham made no individual objection to the court but protested that they had no authority to try him that he was in neither the land nor naval forces of the united states nor in the militia and was therefore amenable only to the civil courts this protest was of course disregarded and his trial went on it was proved that he made the speech of which we have already given an abstract he called as witness in his defence s s cox who was also one of the orators of the occasion and who testified that the speech of mr vallandigham though couched in strong language was in no respect treasonable when the evidence was all in the accused entered a protest against the entire proceeding repeating the terms of his original protest and adding that his alleged offence itself was not known to the constitution nor to any law thereof it is he said words spoken to the people of ohio in an open and public political meeting lawfully and peacefully assembled under the constitution and upon full notice it is words of criticism of the public policy of the public servants of the people by which policy it was alleged that the welfare of the country was not promoted it was an appeal to the people to change that policy not by force but by free elections and the ballot-box it is not pretended that i counsel disobedience to the constitution or resistance to laws and lawful authority i never have beyond this protest i have nothing further to submit there were no speeches either in prosecution or in defence when the court was cleared it remained in deliberation for three hours and returned a decision that the accused was guilty of the charge of publicly expressing in violation of general order number thirty eight from headquarters department of the ohio his sympathy for those in arms against the government of the united states declaring disloyal sentiments and opinions with the object and purpose of weakening the power of the government in its efforts to suppress an unlawful rebellion they therefore sentenced him to be placed in close confinement in some fortress of the united states to be designated by the commanding officer of the department there to be kept during the continuance of the war general burnside approved the finding and the sentence and designated fort warren boston harbor as the place of confinement in accordance with the sentence but before the finding of the commission was made public george e pugh as counsel for vallandigham applied to judge levitt of the united states circuit court sitting in cincinnati for a writ of habeas corpus on the eleventh of may the case was heard and extended arguments were made by mr pugh in favour of the motion and by a f perry who appeared on behalf of general burnside against it but the most noticeable feature of the trial was a written address from general burnside himself presented to the district attorney in which he explained and defended his action he began by saying that he was prohibited by law and by his duty from criticizing the policy of the government that such abstention from injurious criticism was binding on every one in the service he then went on to say if it is my duty and the duty of the troops to avoid saying anything that would weaken the army by preventing a single recruit from joining the ranks by bringing the laws of congress into disrepute or by causing dissatisfaction in the ranks it is equally the duty of every citizen in the department to avoid the same evil if i were to find a man from the enemy's country distributing in my camps speeches of their public men that tended to demoralize the troops or to destroy their confidence in the constituted authorities of the government i would have him tried and hung if found guilty and all the rules of modern warfare would sustain me why should such speeches from our own public men be allowed 
he even went so far as to disapprove the use of party names and party epithets saying the simple names of patriot and traitor are comprehensive enough if the people do not approve that policy they can change the constitutional authorities of that government at the proper time and by the proper method let them freely discuss the policy in a proper tone but my duty requires me to stop license and intemperate discussion which tend to weaken the authority of the government and army whilst the latter is in the presence of the enemy it is cowardly so to weaken it there is no fear of the people losing their liberties we all know that to be the cry of demagogues and none but the ignorant will listen to it judge humphrey h levitt denied the motion for habeas corpus in a long decision in which he thoroughly reviewed the legal points involved in the case the essential point of his decision was this general burnside by order of the president had been appointed to the military supervision of the department of the ohio including among other states the state of ohio the precise extent of his authority was not known to the court but it might properly be assumed that the president had clothed him with all the powers necessary to the efficient discharge of his duties it is not claimed that in time of war the president is above the constitution he derives his power on the contrary expressly from the provision of that instrument that he shall be commander-in-chief of the army and navy the constitution does not specify the powers he may rightfully exercise in this character nor are they defined by legislation no one denies however that the president in his character is invested with very high powers which he has exercised as commander-in-chief from time to time during the present rebellion his acts in this capacity must be limited to such as are deemed essential to the protection and preservation of the government and the constitution and in deciding what he may rightfully do under this power where there is no express legislative declaration the president is guided solely by his own judgment and is amenable only for an abuse of his authority by impeachment the occasion which calls for the exercise of this power exists only from the necessity of the case and when the necessity exists there is a clear justification of the act the judge concludes that if this view of the power of the president is correct it implies the right to arrest persons who by their mischievous acts of disloyalty impede or endanger the military operations of the government he continued and if the necessity exists i see no reason why the power does not attach to the officer or general in command of a military department the only reason why the appointment is made is that the president cannot discharge the duties in person he therefore constitutes an agent to represent him clothed with the necessary power for the efficient supervision of the military interests of the government throughout the department in the exercise of his discretion he general burnside issued the order number thirty eight which has been brought to the notice of the court judge levitt would not comment on that order but only referred to it because general burnside had stated his motives for issuing it and also because it was for its supposed violation that he ordered the arrest of mr vallandingham he had done this under his responsibility as the commanding general of the department and in accordance with what he supposed to be the power vested in him by the appointment of the president it was virtually an act of the executive department under the power vested in the president by the constitution and the court therefore refused to annul or reverse it the arrest trial and sentence of vallandigham took the president somewhat by surprise and it was only after these proceedings were consummated that he had an opportunity seriously to consider the case if he had been consulted before any proceedings were initiated there is reason to believe he would not have permitted them but finding himself in the presence 
of an accomplished fact the question now given him to consider was whether he should approve the sentence of the court or by annulling it weaken the authority of the general commanding the district and greatly encourage the active and dangerous secession element in the west he concluded to accept the act of burnside as within his discretion as military commander but as the imprisonment of vallandigham in the north would have been a constant source of irritation and political discussion the president concluded to modify his sentence to one which could be immediately and finally executed and the execution of which would excite far less sympathy with the prisoner and in fact seriously damage his prestige and authority among his followers the method of punishment which he chose was doubtless suggested by a paragraph in burnside's order number thirty eight which had mentioned as a form of punishment for the declaration of sympathy with the enemy deportation beyond our lines into the lines of their friends he therefore commuted the sentence of vallandigham and directed that he be sent within the confederate lines this was done about a fortnight after the court-martial mr vallandigham was sent to tennessee and on the twenty fifth of may was escorted by a small cavalry force to the confederate lines near murfreesboro after a short parley with the rebel vedettes who made no objection to receiving the prisoner he was delivered into the hands of a single private soldier of an alabama regiment mr vallandigham making a formal protest to the effect that he was within the confederate lines by force and against his will and that he surrendered as a prisoner of war the arrest and sentence of this distinguished democrat produced a profound sensation throughout the country it occasioned general rejoicing in the south the government in richmond saw in it a promise of counter-revolution in the north and some of the confederate generals built upon it the rosiest hopes for future campaigns general beauregard writing to a friend in mobile said the yankees by sending vallandigham into bragg's lines had indicated a point of attack he suggested that hooker being disposed of for the next six months at least lee should act on the defensive and send bragg thirty thousand men to take the offensive at once let bragg or some better soldier who is sufficiently shadowed forth in parenthesis destroy or capture as it is done in europe rosencrans's army then march into kentucky raise thirty thousand men more there and in tennessee then get into ohio and call upon the friends of vallandigham to rise for his defence and support then call upon indiana illinois and missouri to throw off the yoke of the accursed yankee nation then his plan growing more and more magnificent as it took grandeur and colour under his pen call upon the whole northwest to join in the movement form a confederacy of their own and join us by a treaty of alliance defensive and offensive what would then become of the northeast demanded the doughty creole how long would it take us to bring it back to its senses the feeling in the north if less exuberant in its expression was equally serious no act of the government has been so strongly criticized and none having relation to the rights of an individual created a feeling so deep and so widespread no further legal steps were taken in the case except an application which was made by vallandigham's counsel for a writ of certiorari to bring up the proceedings of the military commission for review in the supreme court of the united states this motion was denied on the evident ground that no such writ could be issued by the supreme court to any such military commission as the court had no jurisdiction over the proceedings of such a tribunal but in the democratic newspapers in public meetings in a multitude of leading articles and pamphlets the question was discussed with the greatest earnestness and even violence the orators and politicians of the democratic party regarding the incident as the most valuable bit of political capital which had fallen to them during the year even some of the most loyal newspapers of the north joined in the general attack 
saying that by the statutes vallandigham was a prisoner of state and that the secretary of war was bound to report him as such to the circuit judge of the district in which his supposed offences were committed to be regularly tried by the civil tribunal but the principal criticism was of course confined to the ranks of the opposition their newspapers and public men vied with one another in a chorus of condemnation to a meeting held in albany on the sixteenth of may governor seymour wrote it is an act which has brought dishonour upon our country it is full of danger to our persons and to our homes it bears upon its front a conscious violation of law and of justice the transaction involved a series of offences against our most sacred rights it interfered with the freedom of speech it violated our rights to be secure in our homes against unreasonable searches and seizures it pronounced sentence without a trial save one which was a mockery which insulted as well as wronged if this proceeding is approved by the government and sanctioned by the people it is not merely a step towards revolution it is revolution it will not only lead to military despotism it establishes military despotism if it is upheld our liberties are overthrown the action of the administration will determine in the minds of more than one half of the people of the loyal states whether this war is waged to put down rebellion at the south or to destroy free institutions at the north we look for its decision with most solemn solicitude the meeting to which governor seymour sent this passionate address passed a series of resolutions insisting upon their loyalty and the services they had rendered to the country but demanding that the administration shall be true to the constitution shall recognize and maintain the rights of the states and the liberties of the citizen shall everywhere outside of the lines of necessary military occupation and the scenes of insurrection exert all its powers to maintain the supremacy of the civil over military law and in view of these principles they denounced the recent assumption of a military commander to seize and try a citizen of ohio clement l vallandigham for no other reason than words addressed to a public meeting in criticism of the course of the administration and in condemnation of the military orders of that general the resolutions further set forth that such an assumption of military power strikes a fatal blow at the supremacy of law they enumerated the provisions of the constitution defining the crime of treason and the defences to which those accused of that crime are entitled and said that these safeguards of the rights of the citizen against the pretensions of arbitrary power were intended more especially for his protection in times of civil commotion they further resolved that in the election of governor seymour the people of this state by an emphatic majority declared their condemnation of the system of arbitrary arrests and their determination to stand by the constitution and that regarding the blow struck at a citizen of ohio as aimed at the rights of every citizen of the north we denounce it as against the spirit of our laws and constitution and most earnestly call upon the president of the united states to reverse the action of the military tribunal which has passed a cruel and unusual punishment upon the party arrested prohibited in terms by the constitution and to restore him to the liberty of which he has been deprived a copy of these resolutions was sent to the president and received his most careful consideration he answered on the twelfth of june in a letter which demands the close perusal of every student of our history he accepted in the beginning and thanked the meeting for the resolutions expressing the purpose of sustaining the cause of the union despite the folly and wickedness of any administration he referred to the safeguards of the constitution for the defence of persons accused of treason and contended that these provisions of the constitution had no application to the case in hand the arrests complained of were not made for the technical crime of treason 
he then proceeded in language so terse and vigorous that it is difficult to abridge a paragraph without positive mutilation to describe the circumstances under which this rebellion began and the hopes of the insurgents which were founded upon the inveterate respect of the american people for the forms of law he wrote prior to my installation here it had been inculcated that any state had a lawful right to secede from the national union and that it would be expedient to exercise the right whenever the devotees of the doctrine should fail to elect a president to their own liking i was elected contrary to their liking and accordingly so far as it was legally possible they had taken seven states out of the union had seized many of the united states forts and had fired upon the united states flag all before i was inaugurated and of course before i had done any official act whatever the rebellion thus begun soon ran into the present civil war and in certain respects it began on very unequal terms between the parties the insurgents had been preparing for it for more than thirty years while the government had taken no steps to resist them the former had carefully considered all the means which could be turned to their account it undoubtedly was a well-pondered reliance with them that in their own unrestricted efforts to destroy union constitution and law altogether the government would in a great degree be restrained by the same constitution and law from arresting their progress their sympathizers pervaded all departments of the government and nearly all communities of the people from this material under cover of liberty of speech liberty of the press and habeas corpus they hoped to keep on foot amongst us a most efficient corps of spies informers suppliers and aiders and abettors of their cause in a thousand ways they knew that in times such as they were inaugurating by the constitution itself the habeas corpus might be suspended but they also knew they had friends who would make a question as to who was to suspend it meanwhile their spies and others might remain at large to help on their cause or if as has happened the executive should suspend the writ without ruinous waste of time instances of arresting innocent persons might occur as are always likely to occur in such cases and then a clamour could be raised in regard to this which might be at least of some service to the insurgent cause it needed no very keen perception to discover this part of the enemy's programme so soon as by open hostilities their machinery was fairly put in motion yet thoroughly imbued with a reverence for the guaranteed rights of individuals i was slow to adopt the strong measures which by degrees i have been forced to regard as being within the exceptions of the constitution and as indispensable to the public safety nothing is better known to history than that courts of justice are utterly incompetent to such cases civil courts are organized chiefly for trials of individuals or at most a few individuals acting in concert and this in quiet times and on charges of crimes well defined in the law even in times of peace bands of horse thieves and robbers frequently grow too numerous and powerful for the ordinary courts of justice but what comparison in numbers have such bands ever borne to the insurgent sympathizers even in many of the loyal states again a jury too frequently has at least one member more ready to hang the panel than to hang the traitor and yet again he who dissuades one man from volunteering or induces one soldier to desert weakens the union cause as much as he who kills a union soldier in battle yet this dissuasion or inducement may be so conducted as to be no defined crime of which any civil court would take cognizance he then applied to the case in hand the clear provision of the constitution that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it and went on to say 
this is precisely our present case a case of rebellion wherein the public safety does require the suspension indeed arrests by process of courts and arrests in cases of rebellion do not proceed altogether upon the same basis the former is directed at the small percentage of ordinary and continuous perpetration of crime while the latter is directed at sudden and extensive uprisings against the government which at most will succeed or fail in no great length of time in the latter case arrests are made not so much for what has been done as for what probably would be done the latter is more for the preventive and less for the vindictive than the former in such cases the purposes of men are much more easily understood than in cases of ordinary crime the man who stands by and says nothing when the peril of his government is discussed cannot be misunderstood if not hindered he is sure to help the enemy much more if he talks ambiguously talks for his country with buts and ifs and ands of how little value the constitutional provisions i have quoted will be rendered if arrests shall never be made until defined crimes shall have been committed may be illustrated by a few notable examples general john c breckinridge general robert e lee general joseph e johnston general john b magruder general william b preston general simon b buckner and commodore franklin buchanan now occupying the very highest places in the rebel war service were all within the power of the government since the rebellion began and were nearly as well known to be traitors then as now unquestionably if we had seized and held them the insurgent cause would be much weaker but no one of them had then committed any crime defined in the law every one of them if arrested would have been discharged on habeas corpus were the writ allowed to operate in view of these and similar cases i think the time not unlikely to come when i shall be blamed for having made too few arrests rather than too many referring to the charge made in the resolutions that mr vallandigham was arrested for no other reason than words addressed to public meetings in criticism of the course of the administration mr lincoln said if this assertion is the truth and the whole truth if there was no other reason for the arrest then i concede that the arrest was wrong but he mr vallandigham was not arrested because he was damaging the political prospects of the administration or the personal interests of the commanding general but because he was damaging the army upon the existence and vigor of which the life of the nation depends he was warring upon the military and this gave the military constitutional jurisdiction to lay hands upon him if it could be shown that his arrest was made on mistake of fact the president would be glad to correct it but he said long experience has shown that armies cannot be maintained unless desertion shall be punished by the severe penalty of death the case requires and the law and the constitution sanction this punishment must i shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts while i must not touch a hair of a wily agitator who induces him to desert there is none the less injurious when effected by getting a father or brother or friend into a public meeting and there working upon his feelings till he is persuaded to write the soldier boy that he is fighting in a bad cause for a wicked administration of a contemptible government too weak to arrest and punish him if he shall desert i think that in such a case to silence the agitator and save the boy is not only constitutional but withal a great mercy he then stated clearly his belief that certain proceedings are constitutional when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety requires them which would not be constitutional when in absence of rebellion or invasion the public safety does not require them he continued the constitution itself makes the distinction and i can no more be persuaded that the government can constitutionally take no strong measures in time of rebellion because it can be shown that the same could not be lawfully taken in time of peace 
then i can be persuaded that a particular drug is not good medicine for a sick man because it can be shown to not be good food for a well one nor am i able to appreciate the danger apprehended by the meeting that the american people will by means of military arrest during the rebellion lose the right of public discussion the liberty of speech and the press the law of evidence trial by jury and habeas corpus throughout the indefinite peaceful future which i trust lies before them any more than i am able to believe that a man could contract so strong an appetite for emetics during temporary illness as to persist in feeding upon them during the remainder of his healthful life the president parried the political thrust in the resolutions by reminding the gentlemen of albany that although they address him as democrats not all democrats are of their way of thinking he on whose discretionary judgment mr vallandigham was arrested and tried is a democrat having no old party affinity with me and the judge who rejected the constitutional view expressed in these resolutions by refusing to discharge mr vallandigham on habeas corpus is a democrat of better days than these having received his judicial mantle at the hands of president jackson and still more of all those democrats who are nobly exposing their lives and shedding their blood on the battlefield i have learned that many approve the course taken with mr vallandigham while i have not heard of a single one condemning it the president fortified his argument by an incident of pertinent history especially adapted to touch the sympathies of democrats the arbitrary arrests made by general jackson at new orleans his defiance of the writ of habeas corpus and his imprisonment of the judge who had issued it near the close of this strong and adroit defence of the action of burnside the president made a remarkable admission in these words and yet let me say that in my own discretion i do not know whether i would have ordered the arrest of mr vallandigham while i cannot shift the responsibility from myself i hold that as a general rule the commander in the field is the better judge of the necessity in any particular case it gave me pain when i learned that mr vallandigham had been arrested that is i was pained that there should have seemed to be a necessity for arresting him and it will afford me great pleasure to discharge him so soon as i can by any means believe the public safety will not suffer by it i further say that as the war progresses it appears to me opinion and action which were in great confusion at first take shape and fall into more regular channels so that the necessity for strong dealing with them gradually decreases i have every reason to desire that it should cease altogether and far from the least is my regard for the opinions and wishes of those who like the meeting at albany declare their purpose to sustain the government in every constitutional and lawful measure to suppress the rebellion still i must continue to do so much as may seem to be required by the public safety there are few of the president's state papers which produced a stronger impression upon the public mind than this its tone of candour and courtesy which did not conceal his stern and resolute purpose his clear statement of the needs of the country his terse argument of his authority under the constitution to suspend the writ of habeas corpus when in case of rebellion the public safety required it his contrast of the venial crime of the simple-minded soldier-boy which was punished by death with the deeper guilt of the wily agitator who claimed immunity through the constitution he was endeavouring to destroy the strong yet humorous common sense of his doubt whether a permanent taste for emetics could be contracted during a fit of sickness met with an immediate and eager appreciation among the citizens of the country and rendered this letter remarkable in the long series of mr lincoln's political writings it is needless to say that it did not meet with equal approbation in all quarters it was received by the politicians of new york to whom it was addressed with the gravest displeasure they answered in an angry yet forcible paper claiming that the original act of tyranny by which mr vallandigham was arrested had been aggravated by the claim of despotic power which they assumed to find in the president's letter 
they wrote with so much heat and feeling that they hardly paused to measure their epithets otherwise they would scarcely have been guilty of the impertinence of speaking to the president of his pretensions to more than legal authority and of criticising his crystal-clear statement as the misty and cloudy forms of expression in which those pretensions were set forth but it is not worth while to rescue either of these letters from the oblivion which soon overtook them in the words of mr lincoln on another occasion the world little noted nor long remembered them their first letter had no function nor result but to call into being the president's admirable reply and the second was little more than a cry under punishment in the state of ohio the arrest of mr vallandigham had precipitated an issue which was in its solution greatly to the advantage of the cause of the union when on the eleventh of june the democratic convention of the state met at columbus it was found to be completely under the control of those opposed to the war and the excitement consequent upon vallandigham's arrest and banishment designated him as the only serious candidate for the office of governor nominating him by acclamation was the readiest and most practical way of signifying their disapproval of the proceedings of the government they passed a series of resolutions affirming their devotion to the union denouncing the arrest and banishment of vallandigham as a forcible violation of the constitution and a direct insult offered to the sovereignty of the people of ohio saying that the democratic party was fully competent to decide whether mr vallandigham was a fit man to be nominated for governor and that the attempt to deprive them of that right by his arrest and banishment was an unmerited imputation upon their intelligence and loyalty they therefore called upon the president to restore mr vallandigham to his home in ohio the committee appointed to present these resolutions accompanied them with a long letter signed by the most prominent democrats of ohio arguing upon lines similar to those followed in the letter from the albany democrats that the action of the government towards vallandigham was illegal and unconstitutional that it had created widespread and alarming disaffection among the people of the state that it was not an offence against any law to contend that the war could not be used as a means of restoring the union or that a war directed against slavery would inevitably result in the final destruction of both the constitution and the union they took up the president's letter to the albany committee and insisted that mr vallandigham was not warring upon the military they disagreed entirely with the president on the subject of the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus they represented the president as claiming that the constitution is different in time of insurrection or invasion from what it is in time of peace or public security and that he had the right to engraft limitations or exceptions upon these constitutional guarantees whenever in his judgment the public safety required it having attributed to him these absurd pretensions they proceeded solemnly to deny them and ask if an indefinable kind of constructive treason is to be introduced and engrafted upon the constitution unknown to the laws of the land and subject to the will of the president whenever an insurrection or invasion shall occur in any part of this vast country what safety or security will be left for the liberties of the people the president sent a reply to this letter briefer than the one he had devoted to albany and not so full in its discussion of the constitutional question at issue for his views in this regard he referred the ohio committee to his albany letter he simply repudiated the opinions and intentions which the ohio committee had gratuitously imputed to him but he assumed the full responsibility for the exercise of the enormous powers which he believed the constitution under the circumstances conferred upon him you ask in substance whether i really claim that i may override all the guaranteed rights of individuals on the plea of conserving the public safety when i may choose to say the public safety requires it this question divested of the phraseology calculated to represent me as struggling for an arbitrary personal prerogative is either simply a question who shall decide or an affirmation that nobody shall decide what the public safety does require in cases of rebellion or invasion 
the constitution contemplates the question as likely to occur for decision but it does not expressly declare who is to decide it by necessary implication when rebellion or invasion comes the decision is to be made from time to time and i think the man whom for the time the people have under the constitution made the commander-in-chief of their army and navy is the man who holds the power and bears the responsibility of making it if he uses the power justly the same people will probably justify him if he abuses it he is in their hands to be dealt with by all the modes they have reserved to themselves in the constitution he disclaimed in courteous language any purpose of insult to ohio in mr vallandigham's case and referring to the peremptory request of the committee that vallandigham should be released from his sentence and to the further claim of the committee that the democracy of ohio are loyal to the union he proposed on what he considered very easy conditions to comply with their request he offered them the following propositions one that there is now a rebellion in the united states the object and tendency of which is to destroy the national union and that in your opinion an army and navy are constitutional means for suppressing that rebellion two that no one of you will do anything which in his own judgment will tend to hinder the increase or favor the decrease or lessen the efficiency of the army and navy while engaged in the effort to suppress that rebellion and three that each of you will in his sphere do all he can to have the officers soldiers and seamen of the army and navy while engaged in the effort to suppress the rebellion paid fed clad and otherwise well provided for and supported if the committee or a majority of them would write their names upon the back of the president's letter thus committing themselves to these propositions and to nothing else he would then publish the letter and the names which publication would be within itself a revocation of vallandigham's sentence this would leave mr vallandigham himself absolutely unpledged the president's object being to gain for the cause of the union so large a moral reinforcement from this clear definition of the attitude of the other gentlemen as to compensate for any damage that mr vallandigham could possibly do on his return the president concluded this letter with the same frankness that he used in that to albany still he said in regard to mr vallandigham and all others i must hereafter as heretofore do so much as the public service may seem to require this overture of the president was promptly rejected by the committee they treated it as an evasion of the questions involved in the case and as implying not only an imputation upon their own sincerity and fidelity as citizens of the united states but also as a concession of the legality of mr vallandigham's arrest and banishment evidently nothing could come from negotiations between parties whose points of view were so far apart as those of the president and the democratic leaders in new york and ohio the case must be resolved by the people of the state whose sovereignty it was said had been violated and the issue was made in the clearest possible manner by the nomination of mr vallandigham for governor of ohio the convention which nominated him determined to leave no doubt of their position not only denouncing the action of general burnside and the president but expressing their deep humiliation and regret at the failure of governor todd of ohio to protect the citizens of the state in the enjoyment and exercise of their constitutional rights the union party meeting at columbus nominated for governor john brew a war democrat and adopted a brief platform of unqualified devotion to the union in favor of a most vigorous prosecution of the war and the laying aside of personal preferences and prejudices and pledging hearty support to the president upon this issue clearly announced and unflinchingly adhered to the canvass proceeded to its close before it ended mr 
vallandigham himself intervened once more not in person indeed but by letters from canada on entering the rebel lines he had gone at once to richmond where he was kindly and courteously received by the confederate authorities although both on his side and on theirs the forms appropriate to the fiction that he was a prisoner of war were carefully observed after a conference with the leading men of the confederate government he went southward and arrived on the twenty second of june at bermuda in a vessel called the lady davis which had run the blockade at wilmington he made only a brief stay in bermuda and then took passage for halifax nova scotia where he arrived on the fifth of july from the canadian side of niagara falls he issued an address to the people of ohio which began with this clever and striking exordium arrested and confined for three weeks in the united states a prisoner of state banished thence to the confederate states and there held as an alien enemy and prisoner of war though on parole fairly and honorably dealt with and given leave to depart an act possible only by running the blockade at the hazard of being fired upon by ships flying the flag of my own country i found myself first a free man when on british soil and to-day under protection of the british flag i am here to enjoy and in part to exercise the privileges and rights which usurpers insolently deny me at home six weeks ago when just going into banishment because an audacious but most cowardly despotism caused it i addressed you as a fellow-citizen to-day and from the very place then selected by me but after wearisome and most perilous journeyings for more than four thousand miles by land and upon sea still in exile though almost within sight of my native state i greet you as your representative he thanked and congratulated the democrats of ohio upon the nominations they had made he endorsed their platform which he called elegant in style admirable in sentiment he claimed that his arrest was the issue before the country the president he said accepts the issue in time of war there is but one will supreme his will but one law military necessity and he the sole judge he was convinced that the war could never be prosecuted to a successful termination he added if this civil war is to terminate only by the subjugation or submission of the southern force in arms the infants of to-day will not see the end of it travelling a thousand miles or more through nearly one half of the confederate states and sojourning for a time at widely different points i met not one man woman or child who was not resolved to perish rather than yield to the pressure of arms even in the most desperate extremity he announced therefore that he returned with his opinion in favour of peace not only unchanged but confirmed and strengthened but nothing availed mr vallandigham was defeated by the unprecedented majority of one hundred and one thousand votes sixty two thousand of which were cast in the state and thirty nine thousand by the soldiers in the field to whom a state statute had given the privilege of voting in view of this overwhelming defeat mr vallandigham thought it prudent to remain during the winter beyond the jurisdiction of the united states he was in constant correspondence however with his associates and adherents and demonstrations were made from time to time against the government for its treatment of him on the twenty ninth of february eighteen sixty four mr pendleton of ohio offered a resolution in the house of representatives that the arrest and banishment of mr vallandigham were acts of mere arbitrary power in palpable violation of the constitution and laws of the united states which was rejected by a strict party vote forty-seven democrats voting in favor of it and seventy-six union members voting against it only two democrats voting with the majority vallandigham's course in opposition to the war had been so exasperating to the union sentiment of the country his speeches had been so full of vehement malice that even those who thought his original arrest an unjustifiable stretch of military power felt no sympathy with the object of it and were inclined to acquiesce in the president's disposition of the case the situation was not without a humorous element also to which the american mind is always hospitable the spectacle of this furious agitator 
condemned by court-martial to a long imprisonment and then handed over by the contemptuous mercy of the president to the care and keeping of his friends beyond the union lines his frantic protest that the confederates were not his friends but that he was their most formidable and dreaded enemy the friendly receptions and attentions he met with in the south and among the sympathizing british officials in the west indies and the northern provinces his nomination by the democratic convention of his state which was forced immediately to apply to the president to give them back their candidate affected the popular mind as an event rather ridiculous than serious and the constitutional question involved received probably less attention than it deserved his letters from canada aroused little or no sympathy and when in june eighteen sixty four he returned to the united states the president declined to take any notice of his presence his dramatic reappearance came unexpectedly upon mr lincoln as his arrest had done he had seriously thought of annulling the sentence of exile but had been too much occupied with other matters to do it when he heard of vallandigham's arrival in the country he wrote a joint letter to governor brew and general heitzelmann who had succeeded burnside in command of the department directing them to consult together freely watch vallandigham and others closely and upon discovering any palpable injury or imminent danger to the military proceeding from him them or any of them arrest all implicated otherwise do not arrest without further order meanwhile report the signs to me from time to time but after writing the letter he concluded not to send it he said in conversation the only question to decide was whether he could afford to disregard the contempt of authority and breach of discipline shown in vallandigham's action otherwise it could not but result in benefit to the union cause to have so violent and indiscreet a man go to chicago as a firebrand to his own party fernando wood had urged him to allow vallandigham to return saying that in that case there would be two democratic candidates for the presidency these war democrats said mr wood are scoundrelly hypocrites they want to oppose you and favor the war at once which is nonsense there are but two sides in this fight yours and mine war and peace you will succeed while the war lasts i expect but we shall succeed when the war is over i intend to keep my record clear for the future emboldened by impunity vallandigham began at political meetings a new series of speeches more violent in tone than those which had caused his arrest but as the effect of them was clearly beneficial to the union cause no means were taken to silence him he defied the government and the army he made vague threats that in case he was arrested the persons and property of those instigating such a proceeding should be held as hostages he was not molested and in august was allowed to take a prominent part in the national democratic convention at chicago where he rendered valuable service to the union party as chairman of the committee on resolutions and offered the motion that the nomination of general mcclellan should be made unanimous End of chapter twelve